podcast for tonight. Thanks for watching. For now, I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Oregon made mail-in voting a thing. And I think we all know how the president feels about it. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country. So we took his concerns to the person who created it. This may be the only way they can vote without endangering their lives. And 108 years ago today, the Titanic sank with four Oregonians on board. So we took a trip into the KGW vault to learn their stories. And hey, did you get that 1200 bucks yet? No? All right, then, say it with me now. Show you the money. Come on again so Uncle Sam can hear you. Show me the money. I need more bigger than that. They're all the way in Washington, D.C. Show me the money. That's more like it. And if you're one of the people who's already seen the money, there might be more cash on the way. Here's the story. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. And hopefully the feeling's mutual. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Haggerty. This is the story, or more like your story. We, we use your feedback and your questions every night to build this little thing, so please keep it coming. Reach out to us on Facebook and Instagram. You can email me at thestory at kgw.com or comment on Twitter using the hashtag HeyDan. So let's talk about the good stuff first. How about that? That $1,200 you may or may not have received yet, if you're getting it at all, it might not be the last bit of stimulus from the government. So today, two House Democrats introduced a bill to give most Americans an additional $2,000 a month for at least six months. Here's how it all breaks down. If you're 16 and up and make less than $130,000 a year, you'd qualify. Married couples making less than $260,000 combined, you'd get four grand, and up to three children could each get $500. Now, look, before we get uh, too excited about all this, remember it was just introduced, so we're going to see where Congress takes it. Not to pivot us totally into negative town, I do want to remind you that tomorrow is Thursday, and that means we're probably going to get to hear the next round of numbers when it comes to the United States and joblessness, as well as in Oregon. And just to soften the blow, I'm going to tell you it's probably not going to be very good news, or at least any better than what we've seen the last couple of weeks. Last week, more than 100,000 people filed for unemployment in Oregon. A record 6.6 .6 million people in the U.S. filed for unemployment benefits last week. A staggering 76,500 filed for unemployment in just one week. So uh, as we sit right now, in three weeks alone, nearly 270,000 Oregonians filed for unemployment. That's more than the entire population of Salem and Gresham combined. And that number is almost certainly going to grow tomorrow. Now, through the CARES Act, that's that big stimulus bill that Congress passed, unemployment benefits did get a big boost. So you can stay on unemployment for longer than you typically would be able to and get that extra $600 per week from the federal government if, and this is a big if, if you can actually file a claim. And that's going to bring us to tonight's quote of the day from Charlotte Wanagat. She's a laid-off bartender from Portland who, got, who told the Oregonian, quote, it's a busy signal every time. And that is exactly what we've been hearing in countless emails and comments from all the people that watch this show. The system, frankly, has been swamped. Oregon's unemployment department is getting 2,400 calls a day, and fewer than a half of those people are getting through. In fact, out of the 270,000 jobless claims that we mentioned, the department has only been able to process about half of them. Half. And not only that, they say that, they've, uh, that, that if you even manage to get through to them on the phone, it's probably going to take about three weeks to even get your first check. This could all end up costing laid-off workers more than $100 million in benefits, all because the uh, unemployment department is apparently using computers from the Reagan administration. Reagan. Do you know what else dates back to the Reagan administration? <laughs> Sony Walkman has forever changed the way the world listens to music, civilized or otherwise. Yeah, that. Now, Oregon is known for years. It needs to update its technology. In 2009, it got $86 million from the federal government to modernize. But the state didn't start early enough, and now it's not expected to be done until 2025. In fact, we learned today that those old computers are the reason that Oregon and Oregonians can't waive that one week waiting period to get their unemployment benefits faster like a lot of other states have done. A department rep told us because of the age of our IT systems and the way that they are connected, there was a real risk of accidentally stopping or delaying benefits to people as we remove the waiting week.
So for now, that one-week waiting period remains, all because Oregon's unemployment office is trying to solve iPhone problems with Walkman technology. Okay, we're jumping back into the mail-in voting debate for tonight's big story. Well, I guess it's kind of weird to call it a debate here in Oregon because it's the way we've been voting and doing things for decades now. But it is becoming a hot-button issue. It did so nationwide after we recently saw these long lines to vote in last week's Wisconsin primary. People having to choose between staying home and staying safe or exercising their right to vote. President Trump has come out against mail-in voting. He claims it is just too easy to cheat the system. Pat Doris found someone who disagrees, the guy who created mail-in voting in Oregon. When we vote in Oregon, you'll often see us tossing an envelope into a ballot box or driving up to a drop-off site. Yeah. Nearly everyone got that ballot in the mail. It's a tradition that dates back to the 1980s when an elections clerk in Albany suggested mailing ballots to voters. And it really took off after the resignation of Oregon Senator Bob Packwood in 1995. Phil Kiesling, now semi-retired, was Secretary of State at the time. Under Oregon law, that was a special election. And a special election could be done in this manner. And we had the nation's first ever federal election using all mailed out ballots to everybody. And turnout went through the roof. He said participation hit 66% and the state never looked back. Voters passed the method for all elections in 1998 with a 69% yes vote. Fast forward 22 years and the country faces spring elections and primaries in the time of coronavirus. Only Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Utah and Hawaii have full on vote by mail systems, but many states now are thinking of adopting some form of it. Oregon Governor Kate Brown thinks they should. Um, it's very secure. Uh, it's very cost effective and it's extremely accessible to our voters and it's one of the reasons why we have one of the highest voter turnouts in the entire country because folks like to vote from their kitchen tables it's very very accessible and what did you think when you saw i think it was last week those lines in wisconsin where people in this time had to go stand in line are you kidding pat i was horrified um, I was horrified that uh, the legislature in Wisconsin uh, would put people's lives and health at risk. On April 7th, Wisconsin pushed ahead with its election, and while thousands waited in line with physical distancing, 71% of the voters used absentee ballots. Washington Governor Jay Inslee said every state should move to the mail-in ballot. There's no reason not to go to mail-in voting ever, particularly now when physical voting uh, exposes everybody to risk. This is a no-brainer. It has increased participation. It has maintained security. It has been scandal and largely glitch-free. It is widely accepted by both parties. There's no reason not to do this. But at least one leading Republican disagrees. Now, mail ballots, they cheat, okay? People cheat. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. While there's no evidence to back that up, some Republican governors agree with the president and are resisting the move. But in Oregon, the Republican Secretary of State says mail-in elections are indeed safe. I think after 20 years, uh, we've proven that our system is very secure and that voters love it. The voters voted it in. They've never made an attempt to vote it out. I think they're happy with it. And um, I, I, I think it's a 20 year history of success. Some, including the governors of Oregon and Washington, believe forcing people to line up at voting booths is a form of voter suppression, a way to keep the vote down. There has been a concerted effort to suppress voting in this country. And it is one of the most venal, un-American things I, I've ever seen in my time in politics. Not only do we have to stop the voter suppression, we have to increase voter participation in general. And I really hope that Washington and Oregon's experience uh, will be enjoyed by all Americans as soon as possible. Kiesling, the former Secretary of State, warns that nationwide voters will find a way to avoid standing in those lines, whether political leaders like it or not. Be very clear-eyed that the alternative is one in which you will be flooded with absentee ballot requests from voters who have figured out that this may be the only way they can vote without endangering their lives, and they're going to they're demand it. 
Okay, Pat Doerr is joining us now. Let's talk about timeline potential rollout for other states or the entire nation to work with mail-in uh, voting. Would this be realistic or even possible to have it in place by November, Pat? Well, the governors say that yes, it would be possible. It's going to be a heavy lift. There's a lot to do. But they say uh, if the political will is there, that it actually, yes, can be done. Now, I can't help but hear the, the two voices, right? We have some Republicans and, of course, the president saying that there is a higher potential for fraud, that there are security risks when it comes to mail-in. Then we hear the people in Oregon who are saying that's not the case. It is, a, it is difficult. Who do, who do people believe here? Well, the folks in Oregon would say you should believe us because they've been doing it for 20 years and both Republicans and Democrats seem to agree that it is safe and secure and it's a good system. They really think that when you hear that nationally, that that's political leaders trying to suppress the vote, to make it too hard for people to go vote. And they think that if everyone goes to a mail-in ballot or an absentee sort of ballot, that you will see a huge increase in the number of people that take part. That's what we saw here in Oregon. All right. Appreciate it, Pat. Yep. Thank you so much. That's my pleasure. On the topic of ballots, we thought it might be a good idea to take a look at what was going to be on ours. Remember, until we hear otherwise, we still have an election happening on May 19th. In Portland, there are a bunch of people running for mayor against Ted Wheeler, and the city commissioner's races are really crowded, too. I'm talking like 40 people total trying to get on city council. In fact, the only seat not up for election is Joanne Hardesty. So, in theory, she could go from the newest city council member to the most senior before the end of her first term. We're going to get a new district attorney in Multnomah County because Rod Underhill is retiring. We're also going to get a new secretary of state. Remember, that's the second highest ranking position in the state of Oregon, right under the governor. And Oregon's only Republican in Congress, Greg Walden, is retiring. So there's this big race for his seat in the second congressional district. And that covers all of eastern Oregon and the Medford area. So we're planning on spending a lot of time on these races as we get closer and closer to Election Day. And tonight, we're going to focus in on one controversial ballot measure. It's a tax. And Metro is hoping, pandemic or not, voters pass it to hopefully put a dent in our housing crisis. Maggie Vespa looked into it. Remember life pre-pandemic? Sure, it wasn't long ago, but the differences were stark. Just look at our coverage. Before it was dominated by headlines of hospital overcrowding and PPE shortages, we talked a lot about Oregon's housing crisis, a problem that, of course, hasn't gone away. Still, Angela Martin knows people have a lot yes no to think about right now. Uh, I was concerned that perhaps um, the homeless crisis in the, our community, it now might have faded more to the background, and that's actually the opposite. Why does she say that? Well, Martin runs Here Together Oregon, a group campaigning for a new homeless services tax proposed by Metro. And new polling conducted by Here Together Oregon shows it's likely to pass. But before we get into that polling, let's break down what this tax would actually do and who would actually pay. The measure would add a 1% tax on high-income individuals and couples in the metro area and another 1% tax on profits for businesses that bring in more than $5 million a year. It's expected to raise $250 million a year for things like addiction services, employment support, and rent assistance. All this was drawn up and referred to the May ballot pre-pandemic, but obviously in the last month or so, the world has changed it dramatically. Enter that new polling. I could see them coming together to support it even more. On the other hand, I could have seen people having the opposite reaction and saying, oh my God, times are tight. Earlier this month, Here Together Oregon hired consultants to take the giving temperature of 600 likely voters across Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington counties. The results show the homeless services tax passing by 18 points with only 4% undecided. The team was pleasantly surprised. People really want to come out of this feeling a stronger sense of community. That said, not everyone is behind this. Last month, two big business groups filed a challenge to the measure in Multnomah County Court, one being the Northwest Grocery Association. The president argues the measure doesn't give a clear plan as to how the money will be spent. Plus, he says, this is, is not the time. You got small businesses, medium sized businesses trying to recover after having this massive layoffs and losing all sorts of sales because we have to do what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to stay home. We're supposed to stay inside. We're not shopping. Retail sales are down. Small businesses are boarding up and they're saying, well, too bad for you. We're going to tax you now. Of course, we will be posting the measure itself at KGW.com 
if you want to check it out. When the story continues, a trip 108 years back into the KGW vault to one of history's most tragic events and the four Oregonians who were there when the Titanic sank. You lose your mentality, wake up to reality, yeah, but Oregon artists get some shelter from the storm. It's been strange learning online, but my teachers have been doing a great job of recording the material and uh, giving us the tools we need to be successful and make it through this pandemic. I think in the future, I'll be very grateful for the extra time that I got to spend with my family before going off to university. Hi, my name is Sophia and I'm a senior at Central Catholic and this time has definitely been challenging because I haven't been able to see my teachers or my friends have a graduation or even a senior lacrosse season but I'm also grateful for this time because it's allowed me to think about what I want to do for the next four years and reflect on what's happened in the last four years um, and I've been able to read more books and to spend more time outside. We're still thinking about our high school seniors out there. So overnight, 108 years ago, the Titanic sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a story that we, we all know, of course, but I'm wondering how many of you at home actually know about all the Oregon connections on board connected to that tragedy. We dug into the KGW vault for you to find a few of them. April 1912, Titanic fever was everywhere. Everyone was talking about the world's largest cruise ship making its maiden voyage from Southampton, England to New York City. Here in Portland, the Oregonian ran ads for the Titanic, trying to sell people tickets for trips from New York later in the year. They also printed this diagram showing just how massive it was. The ship would have stretched across the heart of Portland's business district at the time. There were four passengers on board from Oregon and dozens of others headed to the Beaver State. A lot of those were immigrants from Europe riding in third class. The most notable Oregonians on board were Frank and Anna Warren in first class. He founded the Warren Packing Company, a fish canning business. He had a salmon fishery in the gorge, in a spot that would later become the town of Warrendale, named after him. 
The Oregonian ran a blurb about the couple returning home on the Titanic after vacationing in Europe and Egypt for their 40th anniversary. But in the early hours of April 15th, well, I think we all know what happened. Disaster hit. The Titanic struck an iceberg and started to sink in the North Atlantic. Anna Warren told the Oregonian that she heard a grinding noise from their room. Her husband went to see what happened, and he came back holding a big piece of ice, saying he was given it as a souvenir. After a lot of assurances from the crew that everything was all right, they eventually made their way to the deck. She was led to a lifeboat, and her husband helped other women climb in. That was the last time she saw him. She survived and returned to Oregon. His body was never found. A lot of other Oregon-bound passengers also died, mostly those in third class. All the members of a Finnish family trying to get to seaside Oregon, including their two-year-old daughter. It's a similar story for a family of Danish immigrants traveling to Portland. Only one survived. Another survivor, second-class passenger Marion Wright from England. She was headed to Cottage Grove, Oregon to get married to a fruit farmer. She was able to get in a lifeboat and claimed she heard the band playing as the ship sank. In a letter written right after she was saved, she wrote, It was terrible and is terrible, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. She made it to Oregon, met up with her future husband. They were married for 53 years and are buried in a Cottage Grove cemetery. If you want us to look into anything for you in our vault, just reach out to us and let us know. Obviously, you can use the hashtag HeyDan, but if you're not really a Twitter person, send me an email at the story at kgw.com or message me on Facebook, whatever is easiest for you. Artists in the gig community are some of the most financially vulnerable. It's a tough time to be an artist, so Storm Large is using her voice to give a boost to the people who entertain us. When we finish the story, next. A lot of people around here look forward to this time of year and all the outdoor concerts once the weather gets nice. But this year, well, I'm not sure where we're going to be allowed to go and do those types of concerts again. So one of Portland's best known voices decided to hold a socially distant one in her backyard. We're going to get through this. We will. It's important that we get through this. I know we will. Am I alive? Oh, is that me? 
My name is Storm Large, and I'm a musician. Uh, I've lived in Portland 20 years, and uh, I'm here promoting uh, my new nonprofit, Gimme Shelter PDX. Said he was a friend. And we're going to be granting performers of all disciplines in the state of Oregon up to $500 to help them pay for rent and their mortgages. Artists are you in the gig community are some of the most financially vulnerable. You know, we usually when you're starting out, you've got like three jobs that are usually in the service industry and all that's done. I'm trying to get live. Come on, dudes. Here we go. It's great. It's the only fun we can have these days. It's perfect. We've got a little bit of an audience out here. I think it's fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, it's filling a need that's really really present. I'm here with James Beaton. <laughs> this is crazy. I hope you guys are all doing really well. So we're just going to get started. I've got you under my skin. She's in the neighborhood. It's pretty cool. Got you under my skin. Well, at first I was I was having sort of hangouts and concerts in my house. And if you are anonymous, then I call them pajama sessions. From all of us, I love you. We're all in this together. Put on the camera and just play my ukulele, sing songs, check in with people, be like, how's everybody doing? I'm not famous, I'm not like J-Lo, but I have a fan base. Oh yeah! I'm not asking for money for these concerts, but if, if you feel compelled because I put on a show for free to donate. I'm not going to ask for money, um, but if you feel compelled to donate or to share the video and say, look at this that they're doing, um, this, is, this is for this fund, you know, then, then awesome. Yeah, we just walked down the street. <laughs> Pretty beautiful. None of us have ever seen anything like this before, ever. Sleep on your shoulder, sleep I'm scared too. Some of the best times, in a sense, of humanity because the best of us stood up for the weakest. Are you going to be that guy that stands up and says, how can I help? I see way more people standing up and saying, how can I help? <laughs> Mr. Rogers always said, find the helpers. And I'd love to be one of the helpers, if I can. If I can. There's a lot of us. Thank goodness. Right on, man. Yeah. I wish I lived in that neighborhood. She got a pretty good voice, doesn't she? Uh, so we got a bunch of um, people writing in, wondering about the senior moments we've been choosing as we give high school seniors an opportunity to talk about the end of their school year or lack thereof. And people were wondering why we only had private schools. Well, we're really only uh, playing what people are sending us. So we want all the public schools kids we can get. I mean, you've seen our Inside Woodlawn stuff. We love our public schools. So please send us, uh, send us your stuff. Seniors out there, parents, tell your kids. Send us. We want to hear what they have to, what they're saying, what they're thinking. Uh, I want to give you something. David Leatherwood writing in saying, sorry, but the crazy non-music you use during the show has made me tune you off. He's done with us, apparently, even though, David, you write in like three times a week to tell me that. So you, you keep watching, man. And I appreciate that. Also, morning anchor Nina Melhoff writing in and saying, it's the employment department, not the unemployment department. Thanks, Nina. That's the end of the story. We'll see you back here tomorrow.